using um, advanced EPR spectroscopy. So as we already heard some lovely introductions today on ion ion hydrogenases and EPR spectroscopy, I will just dive into the topic. And um, yeah, usually ion ion hydrogenases are very sensitive to the exposure of oxygen. And um, yeah, but there's actually um, at least one ion hydrogenase uh, from Clostridium by Rinki, termed CBA5H, which was shown to protect itself from oxygen exposure via formation of an inactive state. And a recently resolved crystal structure shows that a conserved cysteine goes through a conformational change, and by occupying the open coordination site, it protect, protects the catalytic center from oxygen. And um, yeah, this formation of the inactive state, short H inact, is partly reversible and thus a unique feature of this newly discovered enzyme. And yeah, we thus wanted to investigate it further and have a look into its electronic structure. Um, in CBA5H, there exist at least three paramagnetic centers, namely the H cluster and two accessory ion sulfur clusters, the so-called F clusters. So we first started characterizing this enzyme by um, looking into the APO enzyme in the dithionide reduced state, where we have two four iron for sulfur clusters and the cubane of the um, H cluster. And the resulting rhombic spectrum is very characteristic for four iron for sulfur clusters. When we measured the same sample at two different frequencies, we can see a significant change in line shape. And this is um, due to a strong exchange coupling between the clusters. And this is also not surprising. As you can see, they are very close to each other. So when we compare our APO enzyme to the fully maturated holo CBA5H, which means that it now contains the D-iron subset and thus um, a complete and active H cluster, we can several, uh, see several new signals arising um, here in this region, which can be associated with the H cluster states. And to kind of deconvolute the H cluster states that we observed in the reduced enzyme, we kind of uh, slightly elevated the temperature to 20 Kelvin so that the four iron for sulfur clusters are broadened beyond detection. And here we could find uh, the H ox, the H ox CO, as well as the uh, H height state. And um, this was also supported by our FTIR data. However, uh, we were not able to fully reproduce the experimental spectrum, and thus we had to take into account a fourth species, which we termed our ox. Interestingly, and here um, the intensity of all samples is, um, or states is almost one to one. Um, as was also shown by FTAR, CBFFH can undergo several cycles of um, oxidative inactivation and reductive reactivation. And this is what we kind of reproduced with the H2O2 cycle and observed it with EPR. So in the H2 reduced state, we can mainly see the paramagnetic species that I just showed you before. Um, upon oxygen exposure, however, the generation of our ox is significantly enhanced. And if we re repeat the cycle again, we can see that in the reduced state, the EPR intensity um, in accordance with the FTR intensity of the inactive state, as well as uh, the activity decreases by approximately 40%. In contrast, the intensity of our ox decreases by only 10%. And this shows us that um, H, our ox is not H inactive. But then we were wondering what actually is our ox. So when four iron for sulfur clusters get into contact with oxygen, they can degrade to three iron for sulfur clusters and a free iron. And this gives relatively characteristic EPR signals. So when we compared our ox to three iron for sulfur clusters, we can see that they have some spectral features in common. And that is the spin equal one half and an almost isotropic signal at G equal two. However, for our ox, we were able to detect it up to 180 Kelvin, and we almost found no adventitious and adventitiously bound iron-3 at uh, the lower magnetic field. So to kind of exclude that we are just detecting an artifact, we tried different purification procedures, and this means that we uh, tested for aerobic versus anaerobic um, purification in the absence and presence of sodium dithionide. And in all cases, the spectral, uh, the signal stayed the same. 
Now, next, we also checked a different oxidant, in this case, the um, hexaretinium chloride. And again, we can observe the signal, which shows us that it's not solely dependent on oxygen. Um, then we changed organism and had a look at the well-characterized um, hydrogenase 1 from Clostridium pastorianium, and there we could only detect the H of C or state at elevated temperatures. Um, as you can see, uh, in the APO enzyme, our ox is absent. So we were wondering kind of if it, if it might be dependent on an amine bridgehead, which is heavily involved in the catalysis. So instead of using the ADT bridgehead for maturation, we exchange it to a PDT ligand that renders the enzyme catalytically inactive. And indeed, our ox is um, also absent in this variant and shows us that an active cofactor is essential for its formation. So lastly, we had a look at the cysteine residue, which is very close to the H cluster and involved in the formation of the inactive state. So when we mutated it to an aspartic acid residue, the formation of H inact is prevented, but not so the one of our ox. However, when you look kind of closely to the line shape, it is slightly perturbed in um, comparison to our ox. And this indicates that um, our ox might be close to the cysteine residue as it affects its electronic structure. <clears throat> so next we were asking ourselves like where actually our ox is located inside of the protein. And um, yeah, to see if it might be related with the ion sulfur centers, we performed 57 ion labeling of the ARPO enzyme. And this um, means that actually all four ion for sulfur clusters are labeled, but not the d iron subset. And when we compared the spectra of the iron 57 enriched samples versus the RX, we can see that the G value does not change, but we observe a significant EPR line broadening that is due to hyperfine coupling interactions between our electron spin and the uh, 57 iron nuclei. Um, so next, to gain more information about this interaction, we performed um, orientation selective and or at four different positions. And um, here we could detect uh, three broad features, which are symmetrically centered around the hyperfine coupling constant A over two and are split by twice the Lama frequency. And to simulate this um, endor spectra, we had to take into account either three or four 57 ion nuclei. But as you can see, the features are not very well resolved at Q-bench frequencies, so it has some kind of uncertainty. Nonetheless, all the, all the resulting hyperfine coupling values are in the range of 28 to 34 megahertz. So next we compared our um, uh, hyperfine coupling constant that we got from the simulation with a single isolated four iron for sulfur clusters. And you can see that they are quite distinct. But uh, to be entirely sure, we have also performed knockout mutations of either FS4B or FS4A. And the resulting activity shows that the variants have only two to, two to five percent residu residual activity left. However, when we look at the X-band spectra at 100 Kelvin, all the variants as well as the Y-type um, show our ox in the reduced and oxidized state. When we look at the relative intensities, the variants show approximately 80% less our ox formation. But this is kind of an agreement with uh, the residual activity. So this shows us that our ox is not related to the F clusters because otherwise we wouldn't expect to see any signal, but again, requires an active H cluster for its formation. So now there's kind of only one cluster left where our ox might be associated with, and this is the H cluster. So therefore, we compared uh, our isotropic hyperfine coupling constants to well-known H cluster states that have been um, reported in the literature. So here we have H ox, where the spin density is mainly located on the D iron subside and H height, where it is on the four iron cubane of the H cluster. And in both cases, it doesn't fit very well to our results. However, when we take into account the uh, HOXCO state from two different organisms, you can see that the um, hyperfine coupling values uh, are very well aligned with our simulation. So this shows us that uh, our OX and HOXCO have the same or a similar spin density distribution. 
that we better distinct now between our ox and H oxyo, we looked into two different samples of CBA5H, where one was prepared with pure oxygen and showing only our ox, and the other one was treated with air. And this gives us a mixture of our ox and the typical H oxyo sigma. So when we now compare the proton andro spectra at three different positions, we can see that with increasing H oxyo intensity, uh, there are clear distinct features in the proton andro, which shows us that um, our ox and H oxyo are not the same species. So at this point, we were quite intrigued and asked ourselves, is our ox actually a new H cluster state? And um, this is also supported as our 57 ion andro revealed similar spin densities for our ox and H oxyo. Also, um, you may have heard the beautiful talk of Alexei Zilakov that he gave during the hydrogenase lecture series, where he also observed um, the signal that we termed our ox, and it shows that it has um, 57 ion andro couplings to the D-iron subside of the H cluster. However, um, yeah, also our um, proton andro shows that our ox is almost identical to those from H ox and or H ox CO. But what kind of holds us back to assign our ox to a new H cluster state is that um, we cannot observe any FKR vibrations that we, that we can associate with our ox. So when you look at the oxygen treated samples, it only shows the H inex that state, but um, also no H oxyo or other vibrations. So at this point, we uh, just got one step back and looked at the structures of different hydrogenases. And they all show a conserved water molecule in the vicinity of the H cluster. Um, and therefore, we wanted to detect the exchangeable protons coupled to our ox. And for this, we uh, took our ox in a, our usual buffer and um, recorded a proton and or to see the exchangeable and non-exchangeable protons. By exchanging the buffer to deuterium, we can um, then get a different spectrum that shows us only the exchangeable protons. And in this case, we have uh, quite a large, um, at least two distinct um, couplings with quite a large hyperfine coupling constant of two megahertz. And this might associate our ox with coordinated water molecules or solvent derived um, protonated species, such as an amino acid with an exchangeable proton. Um, yeah, lastly, we had an overall look of, um, and looked into other wild type iron ion hydrogenases um, and see if we can find a similar species. Um, but that was not the case. However, when we had a look at truncated iron ion hydrogenases, um, we actually found one or two. So when we look at the uh, C acetobutylicum hydrogenase, this one has uh, four additional iron sulfur clusters. And in this uh, publication, they basically knocked out either the FS4C or the FS2 cluster. And when they took EPR spectra from it, you can see that in the reduced and oxidized state, they observed a signal which is very similar to ours. And intriguingly, it also increased significantly in intensity when they oxidized the um, hydrogenase. Um, another example is the Megasphera Estini hydrogenase, where they basically cut off the whole F cluster domain so that it has no um, accessory iron sulfur clusters anymore. And here they found in um, for H ox, they only found slight changes, but the H ox CO or CO treated state uh, completely was completely altered in the EPR um, spectrum in comparison to the uh, Y-type enzyme and the well-known HOXCO signal. However, the resulting FTAR spectra are kind of identical. Um, it was, uh, might also be interesting to note that in both um, truncated variants of um, both of those organisms, um, the truncation changed the bias towards the H2 production. And um, also they both were shown to be a bit more oxygen sensitive than the usual ion ion hydrogenases. Can I? Three yeah. minutes? Yeah, I'm kind of done. <laughs> Quick. So, yeah, so with this, uh, I want to um, kind of leave you with the still unsolved mystery of our ox. And I mean, there's still a lot of open questions like what is the identity? Might there be another ligand bound state? We only recently researchers found that actually a cyanide can also bind to the open coordination site. And what is the role of ion sulfur clusters in oxygen resistance? 
And yeah, I especially want to thank my supervisor, Mibi Kazan Masha, if you couldn't be here, unfortunately. And um, yeah, she, she always constantly supported me and put a lot of time and effort into this project. And I also want to thank our collaboration partners, Professor Thomas Happe and Andreas Schutz, who prepared all the samples and um, uh, for sure Resolve and my group for financial and emotional support and the organizers for um, yeah, making this meeting, meeting happen. Thank you.